Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jin Young Jin. I'm the Director of Culture Programs at the Charles B. Wong Center. And thank you so much for coming for this afternoon for a very intellectual uh, lecture entitled Pluralism in the Devotional Islamic Art of uh, South Asia by Mr. Yusuf Saeed. Mr. Saeed is here with us from India, and he's the curator of our current exhibition, From Mecca to Sufi Shrine, Islamic Poster Art from South Asia. Mr. Saeed is Delhi-based independent filmmaker and writer who currently manage a digital archive of South Asian popular visual culture. Mr. Saeed has produced TV programs and documentary films, and he has written for the Times of India and other periodicals. He has also researched and documented South Asian popular Islamic art and is cultural heritage and his uh, newly published catalog is on display in our exhibition. It was published in 2017 and is part of the exhibition, so you can view and if you want, you can order it online. We have a, a publisher's info at our registration table. So today, Mr. Saeed is going to share with us uh, very vibrant examples of devotional Islamic art associated with the Sufi and their shrines and that he collected in India and Pakistan. So we'll have an official opening reception followed by his lecture. So please feel free to ask any questions directly to the curator of our exhibition. So please welcome Mr. Saeed. Thanks a lot, Jin Yong. Uh, and thanks uh, the C.B. Wong Center for giving me this opportunity to show you some of this work. Um, I am basically, a, I'm not an academic uh, researcher in, the, in a formal sense. I'm more of a media practitioner. I'm a filmmaker and a collector of uh, visual arts. Um, what you are going to see today uh, in this uh, this institution is this um, uh, a collection of posters that, that have been documented over several years from India and Pakistan, mostly Islamic posters. Now, uh, let me give you a little introduction of what this art is all about. Basically, when we think of art, what comes to our mind is um, paintings, sculptures, and contemporary art or classical forms of art, archaeological art, which you find in museums and libraries and, and, and art galleries. But what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to show you is, is not something that you will find in a museum or a gallery. It is something that you'll probably find in public spaces, in streets or people's homes. Uh, and these are Sometimes some people would even have difficulty calling it art and uh, some people would just assume it to be uh, useful images or images of utility uh, which people put in their homes in South Asia, India and Pakistan. Um, so these are basically mass produced images um, which people buy and put in their homes for devotional purposes, for religious purposes. Um, there are Hindu images, Islamic images, and images of all, all religions that you will find. So I have been concentrating mostly on the uh, Islamic art of South Asia. I've collected some, and we have an archive, uh, an online archive called uh, Tasveer Ghar. Uh, Tasveer Ghar is a Hindi uh, phrase which means a house of pictures or a house of images, where you will find uh, a whole lot of these um, popular visual culture or popular art being documented, not just the religious one, but various other kinds, even, even cinema images, um, you know, advertisements, commercial advertisements, how they have been produced, how they have been liked by people. So um, let me begin by giving you, uh, you know, a kind of a, uh, a tour of what the visual um, world, a popular visual world in India or Pakistan looks like. So this is a typical um, roadside shop or, a, or just a shack where somebody is selling these posters. Posters are, you can say, a poor man's um, a way of uh, you know, uh, 
decorating their homes. So a large number of these posters are produced uh, and they are available very cheaply, very inexpensively and they are available and you can see, I'm sure some of you can recognize what these images are all about. Some of them are religious images, some of them are uh, cinema uh, stars and uh, even these, uh, you know, these physical sort of bodybuilders and, and cute children and, and uh, European kind of uh, sceneries, you know, these, these Swiss landscapes and so on. All these things are available um, for people and I somehow believe that they reflect a kind of a dream of, of the people who use them because these are images, these are places which they probably cannot go or they cannot visit or they cannot um, have or they cannot um, own. So they, they just imagine them in their dream kind of a situation and they put them up in their homes. So I've been documenting some of these uh, images uh, when we talk about the Islamic images, um, there is a particular uh, kind of a market for them. There is, uh, there is something like a Sufi shrine uh, or, or a shrine where people from all religions uh, visit and, and uh, they come there for, for devotional purposes. So this is like a, a, a typical gateway into a Sufi shrine. And the moment you enter a Sufi shrine in India or Pakistan, the first thing which comes uh, is, is, is these very colorful uh, visual kind of culture there. You will find these pieces of cloth which are hanging, which people buy and uh, offer at, a, at the grave of a Sufi saint and many other uh, kinds of uh, visual material that is being sold uh, on the streets there. You have these religious ephemera, you have um, prayer beads, you have little uh, religious images, you have prayer books, you have calligraphic uh, images, various types of images which you will find, which a large number of people who are visiting these shrines on a kind of a pilgrimage they buy and they take back home and they use them for their devotional purposes. You will find even plastic kind of material and, and some of this material is actually produced in places like Taiwan and China and, and imported into in Pakistan and sold uh, very cheaply. Um, so it's, it, there's a whole, um, as, I, as I said right, right in the beginning I said that it's difficult to even call it art, it's more like an ephemera, uh, uh, you know, commercial eph ephemera, which uh, of course has artistic appeal to it. But um, unfortunately it's not, uh, it's not been studied properly, it has never been documented, it has never been studied seriously to see what, what's happening in, in so um, I and some of other scholars have tried to study as to what is the need for such things and who really buys them and what do they do with them. Because you know there is one central um, thing that I must say which is that uh, a lot of people believe that Islam doesn't believe in images. I mean, most Muslims think that uh, use of images is uh, sort of banned in Islam. And if that is the case, then why so many images? Why so much visual ephemera that is available outside? So, um, well, there can be several explanations to that. Uh, even though theoretically Islam or Muslims are not supposed to use images, but in practice, a uh, large number of Muslims do use uh, these images and they have a kind of religious um, affiliation to these images. So, uh, the most common images in any Muslim home you will find is the Mecca and Medina, the shrine of Mecca and Medina. Mecca is this cubicle uh, little structure uh, in the shrine in the town of Mecca, uh, which is often covered with, uh, with these cloth. Uh, and then there is uh, the dome, the green dome of Medina, beneath which is the, 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 um, the, the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad. These are two central icons that you will find in almost every Muslim home, every believing Muslim home. And then there is the picture of the, the, the Quran, the book, the holy book. Uh, and these images have been uh, drawn by artists in a variety of styles. Now, let's go a little back in time as to where does this whole um, industry of, of uh, poster art uh, really start. So we come to a, a character, a, an artist named Raja Ravi Verma, 
who was there, uh, he was from Kerala, from, from a sort of a royal family of Kerala. And Raja Ravi Verma is a, a, one of the first artists in India who started making painting in a, in a sort of a western style of painting. So far, um, till the end of 19th century, some of the painting style that you see in India was uh, rather flat, uh, sort of two-dimensional art. Um, where, where there, there are several art styles, there are several painting styles, whether it's the Mughal style or the Rajasthani style or the Pahadi style. There are several uh, styles that are available. So in South India, there are styles. They were mostly um, flat, two-dimensional paintings. Um, but the first time when, when the Western style, the European style is introduced into India and several artists started uh, copying or, or using that Western style, they got trained in that, then we have a, a new style emerging which is often called the company style. By company I mean the, 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 the British uh, East India company, how when it comes and how they introduce the European style and some of the Indian artists start adopting it. And Ravi Verma was one of the first uh, artists to have done that. Now he was mostly doing these uh, portraits of uh, rich people. And the special thing about these portraits is, uh, as I said, it's, he's using the Western style, is that uh, he's playing with light and shadow. You know, this is the first time that an Indian artist starts using light and shadow. He starts using models to make paintings. And uh, in other words, he starts using these um, a sort of a three dimension or a perspective to uh, his paintings. So if you look at some of these paintings of Ravi Verma, you will see that there is a perspective, there is a, you know, the things which are closer to the, to the audience or the camera are larger and the things which are at the back are, are smaller. So that's, that's the kind of perspective that we start seeing in Indian art with uh, Ravi Verma. There were several other contemporary artists who must have done that, but Ravi Verma is one of them. Um, apart from the uh, portraits of the people, living people uh, that he did, he was also doing a large number of religious images. Uh, so Hindu deities, Hindu gods and uh, goddesses he started doing. And again, this is the first time he actually was using um, uh, people, he was using models, human models to make Hindu gods and goddesses. And uh, a large number of people thought that that, that was a very unorthodox thing and, and uh, there was objection, there, was, there were people who, who tried to, you know, um, um, they, they, they didn't really like the idea that human models were used for making Hindu gods and goddesses. But still, his paintings became so popular uh, and, and there was so much demand for his paintings that after a point he started printing them. And he started one of the first uh, color printing presses in India, in Mumbai and then later on moving to a uh, place called Lonavla, uh, Karala Lonavla in, uh, in the hills near Mumbai. Uh, so a large number of these prints were made and, and distributed, sold. Um, uh, even today, if you go to some of the older um, temples in India, you might find uh, original prints from Ravi Verma Press uh, framed and put up. So I was curious to know whether there is, apart from the Hindu posters and calendar art, is there any Islamic image that being produced by uh, the Ravi Verma Press? And with my research, I finally found a couple of images. So for instance, this image is the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of map or naksha of Makkah, Makkah Muazzama. So, uh, and I can say that this is one of the first printed image of Makkah in India that you find. Uh, this was done uh, um, in, the, in Urdu, there is a byline which says, Ravi Verma, fine arts, litho works, Kagla, Runavala, Makkah Muazzama. And here it says Anand Shivaji Desai, Moti Bazaar, Mumbai. So Anand Shivaji Desai was basically a business partner of Ravi Verma and he sort of put in his money, invested the money and, and even after the death of Ravi Verma, because Ravi Verma died in 1906, uh, Anand Shivaji Desai continued printing these uh, posters and continued the business. So uh, this is from sort of uh, 1910s or 20s, so we don't know whether actually Ravi Verma Draw, has drawn this image or maybe someone else drew it, but it definitely came out of uh, Ravi Verma Press. A very similar image is the, the shrine of Medina. So Mecca and Medina are these two shrines which uh, uh, Muslims all over the world uh, you know, revere 
and uh, they, they wish to go to uh, on a pilgrimage to these uh, places. So uh, these pictures were actually used as pilgrimage maps um, so that uh, somebody who's um, you know coming back from Mecca or, or aspiring to go there, they could take a look at these images and you know they would imagine what the place looks like because um, in, in the if you I don't know whether you can see but there are small um, sort of um, names written so there are names of the gates uh, all around so where you enter what you do and so there are little things written on uh, in Urdu uh, on these images so that's how we know that these are pilgrimage maps and uh, there was a culture of pilgrimage maps in India also like if you go to Varanasi or Ujjain or many um, um, uh, pilgrimage places, Hindu pilgrimage places, there would be, you would find maps, uh, pilgrimage maps, which were meant for the pilgrims. They would buy them and they would know what are the special places, what are the special uh, locations that they must visit. So there was a business, uh, there was a market for such images and that is how they were largely produced and, and, and sold. Um, in this image you can actually see, it's like a, um, on the top uh, left, it says in Urdu, Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz means, you know, a bidding, a due to somebody who's leaving. So in a way, it's a caravan going to Mecca. Because here you don't see Mecca in Medina. The mosque that you see at the backdrop is, is a very typically Indian or South Asian mosque. And uh, even though this person is wearing a, a, an Arab uh, sort of cloth, but uh, they are basically bidding a due to uh, people who are going for uh, pilgrimage. On the right hand side, there is a signature of the artist, again in Urdu, it says P. Sardar. P. Sardar was an artist, he was a Muslim artist, so he's put his name very prominently. So we have image, a lot of images of this kind which were produced throughout 20th century and some of them you can see in the exhibition here. Um, and interestingly, as I mentioned right at the beginning, that there is no god or goddess, there is no image of god or goddess in, in, in Islam. There are no deities in Islam. Uh, so for instance, Hindu images, Hindu posters, you will actually see the deities. You will see uh, Krishna or uh, Radha or, or, or Shiva or whatever. You know, there are so many images of actual deities you can find. But in Islam, what do you, what do you visualize? How do you visualize apart from Mecca and Medina? Mecca and Medina is the central uh, figure, but what, what else can you do? So I looked at all these posters and I found that the artists are, uh, are finding creative ways to depict something, something new, something interesting, something other than Mecca and Medina. So they're putting a lot of very local Indian iconography into these images. And interestingly, the same artists are doing Hindu and Muslim images. The same publishers are doing Hindu, Muslim, Christian images. So you have a, Mecca, a picture of Mecca Medina being produced by an artist like Bal Krishna, or a picture of uh, Krishna uh, being produced by an artist like uh, Raza, uh, you know. Uh, so, so there are. It's a very interesting, uh, pluralistic kind of uh, industry where um, there is no, uh, there is no hard and fast rule that only Hindus will do Hindu images or Muslims will do Muslim images. It's all uh, a lot of mix-up is happening in, in this industry. So it's a very interesting image as you see that there is this uh, pigeon uh, right in the middle and this pigeon has a, a little small piece of paper in his uh, beak and it says Muhammad Kamli Wale. Muhammad Kamli Wale means Muhammad who wore a blanket, Kamli or Kambal. And uh, it's a very popular expression and especially in India, Pakistan, people lovingly call Prophet Muhammad as Muhammad Kamli Wale. The, Muhammad who wore a blanket. Um, uh, you know, you you will find that uh, people when they want to express their devotion to somebody like Prophet Muhammad, they would have a very loving kind of expression. So this is a, a kind of a letter which is being sent by this pigeon uh, addressed to Muhammad Kamriwale. So in a way, the artists, the local artists, are actually um, expressing their devotion, uh, expressing their desire to, to, to go to Medina, in a way an artist or a, or, or, or a Muslim who cannot afford to go to Medina is sending a letter through this pigeon that you take this. And even in the poetry, if you look at some of the devotional poetry of Islam in, in India, you will find that there are descriptions of um, uh, 
um, you know, sending a letter by a pigeon to Medina and saying that, oh, Prophet Muhammad, I want to come to your shrine, but I'm unable to come, and so on. So there are many very interesting uh, sort of, uh, you know, iconography that is being explored through these. Again, it's a very interesting image there. You see these two uh, white doves, and uh, you can you can notice that there is a blood dripping from from the, the feathers from from the dove. What what does this mean? And uh, you can see the name of the artist is Bal Krishna. So a Hindu artist is making a painting of Mecca Medina and drawing these two white doves with, uh, with 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 bleeding heart, bleeding sort of feathers. So I was wondering what this means, and uh, I figured out that actually. Um, Bleeding heart doves is a is an icon even in Christianity and, and many other faiths, many other cultures where a bleeding heart dove means a kind of a an expression of self uh, self flagellation or self affliction uh, or sacrifice, saying that you know I aspire to go to Medina, I aspire to go to the house of the Prophet Muhammad, but I'm not able to go. So in a way. He's, the artist is self-afflicting himself, self, uh, sort of uh, in a pain. You know, it's, it shows a pain in, from the heart that, that you know I'm not able to go to Medina, and that's how this uh, this bleeding heart. So I've always been fascinated how an artist puts their uh, his or her personal kind of expression through these images. Okay, a large number of these images are actually, they will never show a living organism or a human or, or a pers person in them because uh, many Muslims believe that it is, not, uh, it is not permissible to put images of people in your home because uh, there is a belief, there is a belief that the Prophet Muhammad said that if anybody's uh, house has a picture in them, then, then the, the angel will not enter that house. I don't know how true that is, but some people still use their images in their home. But uh, for that market, for that user who doesn't want to put a human figure, the, the industry produces images where you don't have any human uh, figure. So this is a, the shrine of Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi. And uh, as you can see, there are no people made in it. So apart from Mecca and Medina, you also find a whole lot of images of the local Sufi shrines. So Mecca, uh, so, so that was Nizamuddin Aulia, and this is uh, the shrine of Alauddin Sabir Kalyar, Kalyari. Kalyar is a small town, uh, um, it used to be in Uttar Pradesh, now it's in Uttarakhand, uh, sort of hill uh, area. Uh, and uh, Nizamuddin Aulia as well as Sabir Kalyari and many others, they come in the same order or same silsila of uh, Sufism which is called the Chishti Silsila or the Chishti order of Sufism. And that was one of the most popular, most uh, famous um, Sufi orders in India and, and thousands of people were attracted by their shrines, thousands of people would uh, visit their shrines. And when they visit the shrine and they go back home, they want to carry some memento, some something, some memory of the place. And uh, so these images really play that role of the and, they are, uh, and, and the industry knows that, so they produce these images in large numbers and, and they are sold outside. Um, so this is the shrine of Moinuddin Chishti in Ajmer. Ajmer is this town in Rajasthan. So again, as you can see, even though the picture is very colorful and very, uh, you know, the colors are very, uh, we, we, we use a style called bazaar art style. So bazaar art is something that where a large, a whole lot of very, very attractive and bright colors are used in. But as you can see again, there are no people made. Even though when you visit this place, it's it's always crowded. Thousands of people will be in this shrine, but the artist doesn't create, uh, doesn't make any human figures. But that's not the case in all all of these images. There are some images where you will find uh, people, you will find some um, you know living characters. So this is a very interesting map, uh, a naksha of uh, Haji Malang Shah Baba in Maharashtra near Mumbai. So at the bottom, you can see that there is a railway station, uh, which is the Kalyan railway station. So it actually sh to tells you how to go to the, the shrine. So you get off at the railway station, you take a taxi, which takes you, say, about half an hour journey. And then you get off there, then you take a bus or a lorry, and that lorry takes you a little further up. 
and after a point uh, you you have to walk you have to trek up the hill so it's a good two hour journey to go to that shrine um, i sometimes think that this picture is like a miniature painting you know the indian miniature paintings used to depict an entire story in within one frame so th this is actually telling you a story of how to go there and on the top there is a lion so lion or other animals are supposed to symbolize uh, the power the, uh, the the spiritual power of the saint so in a way if you, they cannot draw the picture of the saint so they have drawn a, a lion so that you know you will know that that is where the the saint lies okay there are many images which are actually using uh, human figures too so these uh, six people these six saints the uh, the right top uh, person his name is uh, uh, abdul qadir jilani and he is actually buried in uh, baghdad in iraq so abdul qadir jilani was revered as a great sufi by almost all uh, sufis of south asia uh, therefore they considered him as their spiritual master or guru so he is always drawn in this uh, picture and then on, on in front of him is the khwaja gharib nawaz uh, who is buried in ajmer see along with the people you also have these little boxes which show the shrines so you know that this person's shrine is this so there are these uh, so 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 the top right person is in patna but all the other five people are in india uh, well now uh, at least uh, one of them is in pakistan uh, baba farid so but the interesting thing is that all six people were not uh, contemporaries in the same time nor they were in the same place so why put them like in a in a meeting because they all belong to the same order or the silsila uh, so that's how these this picture has been drawn and then i found out that actually this image comes from a much older source uh, even during the mughal period there used to be mughal miniature paintings which depicted all these six characters and that's how the bazaar artist or the calendar artist has uh, sourced uh, this image uh, drawing um, this is a saint uh, his name is uh, baba tajuddin and he is buried in nagpur in maharashtra and along with him is this young girl who was a kind of a disciple or an adopted uh, daughter and uh, so so both of them have been drawn together and uh, on the top corners you see these little tables which have some figures in them some numbers and some figures those are supposed to be talisman or or some kind of um, you know holy figures which which bring you good luck and they they bring you protection and so on so these images play uh, 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 several roles they they they're not only depicting you depicting the uh, the the same but they are also useful they are also utility in in the sense that they they have these uh, talisman in them uh, some of the images are so interesting in terms of the mythology or the folklore that they depict that nobody can probably say that this is actually a islamic images you know these are two sufis uh, shah badiuddin madar and shah mina um and it's a kind of a meeting of the two saints where uh, one had such a spiritual power that they, he could uh, ride a tiger and he could have a serpent in his hand the other person now uh, when you see uh, you know the, the the bottom of this picture there is a little platform on which he is sitting and it's broken now normally nobody would notice that why this platform is broken um but i got to know that actually the story the reason why the artist has shown that broken because uh, the story is that when this guy was doing uh, ablution or the washing of his face with that utensil he got to know that the other saint is coming to meet him and he was so excited that he ordered the wall to take him in that direction so the wall broke and took him in that direction so the artist has actually drawn that so that such is the spiritual power of these things so very interesting uh, kind of st stories that these these images uh, depict you will find these images being sold on the streets 
Um, and th there's a certain class of people who, who uh, use them and, and those stories circulate uh, in their families. Probably uh, a whole lot of modern Muslims will not, may not have seen these images because they are, they don't think that these images have any value in Islam because a large number of orthodox um, sort of um, puritanical Muslims do not believe in these images. They think that this is something you know, beyond Islam, it doesn't belong to Islam. In fact, some people ask me, why are you taking these images so seriously? They don't belong to Islam. But, uh, you know, for me, it's a different kind of Islam uh, which you can interpret in India. So again, this saint, uh, he was, he used to roam around, his name is Baba Selani, and Selani literally means a wanderer, somebody who used to wander in the forests, and he would tame wild animals, and so these wild animals that are sitting peacefully around him, um, and the artist is also actually drawing, you know, probably not originally, he has taken uh, this tiger and lion from some wildlife magazine and cut and paste and put them together. Um, that's how this bazaar art works. Again, there is also a kind of a give and take between Hindu and Muslim images, Islam, you know. So this is, uh, this is, this image is from Pakistan. And uh, even though it says Khwaja Khizr, uh, who is supposed to be a, not a saint, but a, a kind of a prophet uh, who is still roaming around in the world somewhere. And, uh, but there is, in Pakistan itself, there is a, another uh, saint who is uh, revered by the Hindus there. Uh, his name is Jhule Lal. So actually, if you just remove the picture of Mecca and Medina and the Quran from it, it is actually Jhule Lal. Uh, so the Julelal image has been taken uh, and made into an Islamic image. So Julelal also roams, uh, you know, he floats in the water sitting on a, on, a, on a fish. Then I did some research and I found out that actually this uh, symbol of a saint or a somebody sitting on a fish floating in the water is a very common um, a character, a very common symbol which you will find in China and in, in, uh, in, in many other places. Many people, many many cultures use this kind of symbol. I don't know. Somebody should do an anthropological, you know, study as to what uh, what it really means. So, uh, as I was talking about this cut and paste uh, thing, this is like literally cutting and pasting with a scissor rather than Photoshop. So this is a picture that I picked up in Pakistan in Lahore, where again a saint is uh, drawn sitting uh, on top of a big uh, lion. Now probably everything in this picture is cut and paste very crudely. And my fascination was with the way this saint has been drawn, the kind of dress he wears. It's a very feminine dress, something like a sari which uh, women wear in India. And his face, as if his face has been just pasted on, on top of a, a, a female uh, face. So very interesting things are happening. This is the saint, his name is Baba Sher Shah Bali. Um, somewhere in Punjab, in Pakistan. Uh, so apart from these uh, saints, there is also the uh, mythology or the folklore related to Karbala, the Battle of Karbala, which happened where uh, a large number of family members of uh, Imam Hussain were martyred. And um, now again, in this picture, you have these red roses, which are depicting the people who were martyred. So in the middle, you have Imam Hussain's Red Rose, then Shehzada, Qasim, and Ali Akbar, Ali Asghar. So there are no people drawn, just the red roses have been drawn to sort of take that uh, Karbala battle. Um, this uh, this uh, horse, which is called uh, Zuljina, Zuljina was a horse which Imam Hussain rode when he went into the battle uh, of Karbala, and everybody had died, everybody had been ma martyred except this, uh, this uh, Zuljina. So somehow that, that horse has become a symbol of martyrdom, a symbol of, uh, you know, the, the sort of Shia identity. And you can see very clearly that there is a river of blood drawn at the backdrop, which shows the martyrdom of uh, people. Again, this image has been made by uh, an artist who just writes H.R. Raja. Now, H.R. Raja is a very ambiguous name. Raja could be a Hindu. But then I found out that his uh, full name is Hassan Raza Raja. So he's a Muslim artist 
when he write, when he draws um, Hindu paintings, he just writes H R Raja. But in this case, he has actually spelled out his name in Urdu. Now um, we come to again just to the, the images where no human or no living organisms have been drawn. So you have calligraphy is a major thing in, in Islamic art, popular art. So calligraphic uh, pictures, you have uh, something like this, Muhammad written in this calligraphic form. And within that Muhammad, there is, there is an entire uh, chapter of the, of the Quran which has been drawn. And then there are roses and, and things like that. So you will find hundreds of such images. You have this tree, which is actually the family tree of the Prophet Muhammad. So since the artist cannot draw Prophet Muhammad's face, so then they have to find some creative ways. And this is one of the creative ways uh, that you have a, a, a tree which has several uh, flowers, and each flower having the name of a family member. And then you have some little leaves, etc. So interesting creative ways they keep finding. Then, um, then there are certain chapters from the Quran which are considered very, uh, very useful, very potent. Uh, that if you if you recite the, a, a chapter uh, like this, so this one called has Yasin, and Yasin is um, many Muslims recite this uh, chapter to bring uh, protection, to bring good luck, to, to as, as sort of a, a protection against evil eye and, and even for treatment of diseases and so on and so forth. So this has become you know uh, the image of a, of a poster. But then there are very specific tabis or uh, talisman which, which are drawn very, very complex structures. Like in this one, you can see there are these boxes, there are these tables with some numbers written in them. And these numbers are actually uh, calculated very, you know, with astrological kind of calculations, the with, you know, calculating with the stars and, uh, you know, like um, totally astro astrology based uh, pictures which are considered very uh, useful for, for various purposes in life, for bringing uh, good luck to home and protection. So these are uh, various types of, you know, there are many purposes of these images uh, as we see. Um, some, some quotations from the Quran are, uh, uh, you know, drawn here in different colors. And these are quotations with people which people memorize, many Muslims memorize and almost recite every day on a daily basis. So for example, this one on the right, uh, it says uh, Jahar Kul. Jahar Kul means it's four Kul. And Kul is like a one quotation or a one chapter, a small chapter from the Quran. So four Kuls are actually the last four chapters of, his, uh, of Quran. And uh, these are so short that almost every Muslim uh, would remember them, memorize them and, and read them. Similarly, the one on the left, it has again these uh, astrological sort of basis of a talisman. Okay, the other the other thing which happens in some of this calendar or poster art is that when the artist has uh, explored all possibilities, you know, Mecca, Medina, Sufi shrine, calligraphy, everything. So, what else can we do? So then they come to this idea of a of a pious Muslim, of a devotional Muslim. So they always draw these women, the praying women or the babies, you know, Muslim babies reading the Quran and so on. So a, lo a large number of these images you will find. And I believe that these images, when they are put up in homes, so a child who's growing up uh, would imagine that, okay, this is how I have to be, you know, this is how a good Muslim has to be. A good Muslim has to dress up like this, or reading Quran and, you know, be pious and be nice. So, in a way, these images are playing a role of upbringing in, in, in a Muslim home and um, showing this, this idea of, of a woman or, or a pious woman or a um, you know, really nice woman, who a nice housewife and so on. So there are these character, you know, stereotypes of not only Muslim community but also of women, you know, pious women. So all these stereotypes come across through these uh, Picture. Sometimes the stereotypes can be very acute, for example, this one. And actually what happens is that then the others, you know, the, the non-Muslims, when they see these images, they start imagining that this is how a Muslim should look like. This is how a Muslim in a typical 
Muslim locality or neighborhood should look like. So this is this picture actually gives that entire uh, thing in a very typecast way. You have the talisman, this guy, the baby wearing a talisman, wearing a cap, and you know reading the Quran, and it's a very typical uh, kind of thing. And uh, sometimes in the mainstream media, then these images lead to a stereotyping of the Muslim community. But uh, very often they are giving out a message of morality and, and you know how uh, the message of Islam also in a way. So this image is very interesting in the sense that if you see the clothes being worn by uh, all these five, six men, you will see that there is not only a cultural diversity but also an economic kind of dis uh, diversity. There are people who are wearing torn and tattered clothes whereas there are some very rich kind of king uh, kind of people. So uh, maybe you can say that the, this is a diversity of South Asia in a way, although South India is probably not depicted so much, but at least, you know, like you have the Pathans, you have the people from Punjab, you have somebody from UP and so on. So very interesting South Asian Muslim character that is being drawn. But at the same time, the, the Islamic message that, you know, in Islam, all men are equal, all men can stand in the same, same row and, and do the do the prayers. So there are many messages like that uh, are given out in these uh, pictures. You have some images are actually um, um, you know shown with the uh, with, with sort of gold plated and so on. So uh, this is a cross section of several types of images that I showed you, and uh, I believe some of these you you can see in the exhibition also. And um, I don't want to take too much of time. Maybe just the last couple of images. I, I forgot to give you the idea that you know actually there is a connection between these images and the Bollywood cinema. So somehow you know there are many movies that are made in India which depict these Muslim characters. So there you you see that that, that stereotype of prayer praying Muslim woman in the same way. Uh, so there are many movies you can find in some of the even the recent film actors and actresses. Okay, so I'll end uh, now at this one um, because this is somehow it takes you into that popular domain of, of India or South Asian popular culture. Um, basically, uh, uh, the idea was to uh, show that uh, despite the fact that you know some people believe that Islam doesn't believe in images, but in South Asia, the images are very much there, the Islamic images, the popular devotional images are very much there, and they're part of people's everyday life, and we cannot ignore them, and that's what you will see in the exhibition. Okay. We have a seven minute video. Do we have the time to show that, or you want to? We do. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Okay. You want to go on? Yeah, so there is a short video. Uh, using the same uh, images and a song because you you know when we talk about these images we cannot ignore this the soundtrack you know the song uh, because there are these kawalis there are popular songs devotional songs which go together you know in a sufi shrine if you go to a sufi shrine you will find these images but you will also find a lot of sounds you know music devotional music so i wanted to kind of put them together and give you a sense of what uh, popular Islam in South Asia looks like. So we'll, we'll uh, watch this little seven minute music video and then uh, if you have any questions I'll be really happy to answer. <laughs> ऑफिस मदीना है तो है काबे में स्टेशन टिकट मिलता है जिसका हजरत जिब्रील से नाजिश अमल के सिक्के देकर जल्द करवा लो रिजर्वेशन चुक 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 रेल चली है जन्नत की चुक 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 रेल चली है जन्नत की चुक 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 रेल चली है जन्नत की 
पंजतनी होगा मुसलमा पंजतनी तो होगा मुसलमा पंजतनी आजा बिलाली इसकी सीटी आजा बिलाली इसकी सीटी चम 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 पे मुख Uh, 
like the Orthodox, you said that like I'm a person. You can say that uh, from modern Muslim. Um, I believe on them. I like them, but as my parents, they are really into it. But I'm not. The thing is that I'm not against them or I don't respect them. I respect them, but I feel like their devotion was until when they were alive. And now if they gone, means that they that can respect them. But uh, just to show that uh, they are the one who can basically, uh, you know, just like get your points to the God is not the only way. That's the thing. I would say that from my perspective and a lot of my generation was thinking like this. That's the thing. And it's still the people, like, as he said that uh, rural people, they still like this, same, just like following and a lot of people from like different, different uh, Regions from like from IM, they come like yearly, and you can see like there are like thousands of people for that like three days uh, kind of uh, uh, event, and they, they go and I never been there. You know, can you imagine like my friend and all that people? They still go yearly over there, and as being I never been there. It's just like the thing that I don't respect them. I respect them. I I know they were there, but it's just like a thing that I I can't. Yeah, good. So, uh, any other, any other questions, any other, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I don't know much about Prophet Muhammad, so who was he? Prophet Muhammad. Okay, he was uh, one of the, he was the last prophet, as they say. You know, there is a tradition which we call the biblical, biblical Quranic tradition in which uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, they believe that there, there, is, a, there is a whole uh, lineage of prophets sent by God to earth to send out his message. In fact, Muslims believe that uh, God sent thousands of messengers to the earth and they could be the, even the messengers of Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever, you know. So we, many Muslims believe that actually anybody who brought a new religion or a new kind of ideology is a prophet is a prophet by the by, from sent by god uh, and muslims believe christians also believe that adam was the first uh, human or the first prophet sent by god and from adam and eve started the entire uh, humanity so that is the proof and the last the muslims believe that the last prophet was prophet muhammad and prophet muhammad if you a little study, you will find that he was born in Arabia, in Mecca, and uh, he started. Um, the, the whole idea was that um, many of these prophets who came, they came to revive, they came to um, sort of um, reform the society. So they believed that any prophet that came, uh, that prophet tried to remove all the bad things, the you know, some of the inhuman things, some of the undemocratic practices in that society. So they believe that Prophet Muhammad also when he came, he brought a new religion, brought new message, brought, uh, he wanted to remove the evil from the earth and so on. So, you know, if you, if you study a little bit about him, you will find that he, he was one of the prophets that, that came, but in, in Islam, in Muslims believe that he was the last prophet and after him there will be no more prophets and his message was sort of the last message and that is what has to be followed. That's what all Muslims believe. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. So I think, uh, again, it's the same follow-up uh, with him. Uh, so in Sufism, the way I know, uh, they believe that the knowledge or spiritual knowledge or spiritual path of devotion, of course, it has to be to God. But uh, you gain that not only from reading scriptures or religious books, but you get, get it from Guru. In, Hindis, in Hindu scripture, we say Guru is a connection between you and the Supreme. So I think Sufism will do the same thing. Exactly. You and the, and the God, that is the Supreme, uh, in between is what we call Murshid. They call it Murshid, we call it Guru. And uh, Guru is your path or teacher or guide or whatever you want to say. Yeah. And he is the one, a Guru has to be that who has achieved that height of achieving spirituality, of seeing the God, of being in touch with God. Yes. He is the one, one blind person cannot read another blind person. Uh, so Guru is not, <coughs> Guru is somebody who has already seen and experienced and, and held God, I don't know, for lack of better words. So 
Does Islam believe there also, or is Sufism believes that? See, first of all, it's uh, difficult to say that Islam and Sufism are two different things. You know, we can't really say that many people believe that they are the same thing. You know, Sufi thought also comes from Islam, and a large number of Muslims who believe in Sufism, they they don't differentiate between the two. They think that it's the same thing. It's the spiritual Sufism is basically the spiritual interpretation of Quran and Hadith. So uh, what you are saying that you need a you need a guru uh, or a murshid, that is true. I mean, many Sufis think that there is a kind of a three steps to God. The first step is, uh, and, and there is a word they use which is fana, fana ho jana, or to get completely immersed into something or dissolved into something. So first you have to get uh, dissolved into your guru or your or your master. Then, uh, so that is called, uh, and then you have to get dissolved into the prophet, the idea of the prophet, and then finally you get dissolved into the idea of God. So these are three, uh, in a way, steps. I mean, that's what many Muslim, many Sufis will know and follow. Uh, so I think uh, then there is a Ishke Majaji, Ishke Hakiki, and yeah. Ishke Muhammadi. So yeah, yeah the same. So yeah. I think are they are they the same three steps that you are saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, yes. In a way, you are saying the same thing. Yes, yes. We are actually, my presentation was not so much about Sufism, it was more about the image practices, the visuals. So, if anybody has any questions about the art and images. I think we can continue this conversation yeah. at the reception. Uh, sure, um, sure. We're going to officially start the opening reception of the exhibition. So, let's give him a round of applause. Please continue our conversation. Okay, uh, thanks a lot and I would lo really love to thank uh, the, the CD Wong Center and, and 